living in a barrel. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and get started. It's good to see everybody uh, that's here on the first day of the week. And um, certainly all those that are joining us online. Um, we need to remember, of course, all those of our number that are sick for whatever reason, whatever afflictions they have. And especially we need to remember Norma Strickland and the loss of Bobby. He passed away this past week. <clears throat> Let's continue to remember her as well. Let's get started with a prayer. Dear God and Father in heaven, hallowed be thy holy and magnificent name. We are so grateful for this first day of the week, the beauty of the springtime, Father, that uh, declares your all-wise and powerful hand. Father, especially we're thankful for our spiritual blessings in Christ, the blessing of study and fellowship and worship. Father, we pray that all that we do will be to honor, bring honor and glory to Thy holy and matchless name. Father, we're thankful for this nation in which we live and the freedoms that we do enjoy, the prosperity. And Father, we pray for our nation during this difficult time and, and other nations as well. We pray that these things will soon be behind us, but we pray, Father, that that will give us a keener awareness of the spiritual and the hereafter. We pray that our aspirations, our goals, the, the things that we put first in our life will be spiritual and eternal rather than the things of this world. Father, we pray that you will continue to bless your people especially. That we can lead quiet and peaceful lives in our service. We pray your forgiveness of our sins and deliverance from temptation. Father, we ask a special blessing upon those of our number that are hurting, those who are sick, those who are recovering from various procedures, and we pray especially for those who've lost loved ones and Norma Strickland, especially at this time, and the loss of Bobby. We pray for their family. Go with us now through our study. We pray that, that only your truth will be taught, that we'll grow thereby, and that uh, in the next hour we can worship in spirit and in truth. We ask all these things through Christ's most holy and precious name. Amen. Okay, we're rapidly coming to a close of our study of Christian evidences. Maybe in another two or three weeks, we'll see. You never know. Uh, but um, we, uh, if you have your outline, well, there's um, got an outline. Can you hear me? There we go. Okay. At any rate, uh, in our study of Christian evidences, we had gotten down to uh, our study of the Bible, uh, evidences for its uh, divine origin. That is, it is uh, God's Word. Uh, and we've looked at several things, uh, 
uh, predictive prophecy, scientific accuracy, and foreknowledge, factual accuracy and archaeological confirmation, um, the uniqueness of the silence of the Scriptures, and the unity of the Scriptures. And, and last week we began looking at, or, or spent quite a bit of time looking at its preservation. And, and not necessarily that that's a point regarding its uh, evidences for its inspiration, but it does say something to uh, the effect of God's providence as far as uh, preserving His Word down through the centuries. That is, uh, we know from the Scriptures that God's Word is indestructible. It abides forever. Um, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24 that His words would not pass away. Uh, and so the question then becomes is, uh, do we have in our uh, modern languages the word that was spoken uh, by the apostles and the prophets of the first century, for instance? Um, you know, how close is that to the original autographs uh, and so forth? And, um, and really up until, what, um, about the 14, 1500s, um, how were copies made of anything, any writing? Yeah, by hand. Uh, pretty meticulous, painstaking, laborious uh, effort. Uh, and so uh, the original autographs had to be copied by hand. And, and at, of course, originally they would have been copied into that same language. Uh, for instance, the New Testament uh, writings of Paul and Peter and the other first century prophets uh, would have been uh, copied straight from Koine Greek into Greek. But then eventually, if the word was going to be spread to other languages, it had to be translated uh, into other languages and uh, again copied from there. And so well, we spent quite a bit of time uh, talking about uh, really how that the New Testament itself is really the most documented work of antiquity. We have over almost 6,000 Greek manuscripts. Um, and then you've got all of the various versions and translations down through the centuries that um, pretty much guarantee that we have pretty close to the original autographs, maybe with very little difference. And of course, we ask the question, well, you know, are translations... Um, are those the Word of God? Well, they are if they're, if they're accurate. Uh, and certainly Jesus uh, demonstrated for us that the use of translations um, is okay. And in fact, it's appropriate and proper because many times he and other first, and even the, other, the uh, writers of the New Testament quoted from what translation of the Old Testament? Yeah, they used the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. They didn't always quote uh, from the Hebrew Scriptures. And the Septuagint at times was different in some places, a little different than the Hebrew Scriptures. And yet, the Bible indicates that they were quoting the Word of God. And so, uh, the New Testament, there's no question that we have it. Um, and then last week, I thought before we left this subject, because I thought this was pretty interesting, because we basically limited our discussion to the New Testament. Um, but um, we started to get into the Old Testament, the, the Hebrew Scriptures a little bit. And I thought this is... And you've heard about this all your life, but I thought some of these details were pretty interesting. And so I wanted to spend a little time before we move into our last topic regarding uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls. And the, re the Dead Sea Scrolls are widely regarded as the greatest archaeological discovery of the 20th century. And the significance of that for us is that um, the earliest um, that we had as far as the Hebrew Scriptures, the earliest copies, if you will, um, of the Hebrew Scriptures in Hebrew, um, would have been medieval translations, around 1,000 AD. And yet, these copies, these manuscripts were found uh, 
of the Hebrew Bible, or at least parts of it, fragments of it, uh, from a community of the first century, meaning now that, that our knowledge of the Hebrew Bible was thrown back how far? That much closer to the original writings. A thousand years, really. A thousand years closer. We know that the Hebrew Bible was written from about 1600 B.C. to when? When, when did those writings end? About 400, right, B.C. Because there's about a 400 year gap between um, when the Old Testament ended and the New Testament begins. We call it the intertestamental period. And so this gets us that much closer. And so it's pretty interesting. Okay, so when we look at these things, again, we ask the question, well, how close is our current Old Testament to what they had now, we can say, to what they had in the first century, not just what they had in 1000 A.D. So from 1947 to 56, about 930 scrolls were found in 11 desert caves near Qumran, which is about 12 and a half miles southeast of Jerusalem. Now, there have been other discoveries made in 11 other sites in the vicinity of the Dead Sea, but this one contained the most. These scrolls span about four centuries, from the 3rd century B.C. to the 1st century A.D., and they're written in four languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek, and Nabataean. Um, and um, this is kind of interesting. Most of the time you hear the story of the Dead Sea Scrolls, what's the story that you hear? What, what, are we, what, what happened? How did they find them? Yeah, this guy, this uh, Bedouin shepherd threw a rock in a cave and crashed. He heard a, he heard a crash and he found these clay uh, jars with these scrolls. Well, that's somewhat the story, but with a little more detail, um, the broken jar and the discovery of the, the cave actually took place two days before they found the first scrolls. And there was not one shepherd, but three. One threw the rock and another one went in two days later without telling his partners. Um, but then when he found them, they took a few scrolls because they didn't know what they were and what they were worth. And that cave became known as Cave One where they found the great Isaiah scroll. What that means is they found, of all the books in the Old Testament, they found a complete copy of Isaiah. And when you take that copy of Isaiah and you compare it to Isaiah that we have, what do you find? We've got the same one. Now, there were many other Old Testament fragments of other Old Testament books. You have the Habakkuk commentary and then the community rule. There was a lot of secular scrolls as well. A lot of things about their community and the way they lived and the rules they lived under. Um, but, and of course, a lot of these caves were looted and the contents sold, so there may have been even more. Uh, but once they figured out how important they were, of course, they, the governments took over and uh, did formal excavation and preserved what was left. Um, and they did all that over a five-year period in the 50s. Um, and so... Uh, and we could go into a lot of other details, but what are some of the important points about these scrolls? Well, of the 930 scrolls discovered, 222 were biblical. So, a lot of people are surprised. A lot of people think, well, they just found a bunch of scrolls of the Bible. No, they found a lot of scrolls of a lot of things. Um, and in fact, in some of the other locations, that percentage is higher. Like at Masada, almost half were biblical. Um, but it still contains a lot of interesting information about how these people lived and how they viewed the Old Testament Scriptures. Did they view them as authoritative or not? Um, and that's some of the relevance that they have. By the way, they also found scrolls of the Apocrypha and the Pseudopigrapha, uh, those writings that we do not consider to be Scripture or authoritative. Um, but again, the most important ones are Old Testament manuscripts. Uh, and here's the interesting thing about it. These people lived in the first century. They lived about the same time that Jesus and the apostles did, and yet 
their writings indicate that they had no knowledge of the Christian movement at all. So this is a Jewish community. Um, and here's the breakdown. 87 of the 200 scrolls, biblical scrolls, uh, are of the Pentateuch. Um, the major prophets are, have about 46, and the minor prophets 10, um, and that leaves about 20, 35, 25 to 30 percent of the rest for the rest of the Old Testament. There was only 18 copies of the historical books, um, and so here's an illustration. Uh, they have one small fragment about the size of your hand that represents all of First and Second Chronicles. So keep in mind when you read stuff about the, sometimes you'll read sweeping statements about the Dead Sea Scrolls that say, well, the Dead Sea Scrolls confirm that the whole, you know, every word of the Old Testament. No, that's not true. <laughs> it doesn't contain the whole Old Testament. And in some books it just contains, you know, a small fragment. And some it doesn't have at all. What it confirms for us is what we did find matches with what we have. And that is important. But don't ever think that they just found the whole Old Testament there. For instance, Ezra through Nehemiah, which was one book, single book in the Hebrew, they didn't find, or Esther. Uh, not as much of the Psalms and other poetic books, uh, although more of the Psalms than the others. And so... Um, Although, as among the standalone books, Psalms takes the crown with 39 manuscripts, Deuteronomy 33, Genesis 24, Isaiah 22, and Exodus 18. Now, this is the part that blows my mind. We talk about God's providence, and we don't always know when it's working. But four of the five books I just mentioned to you are on the top five list of books quoted by Jesus. So here's the point. I've got a breakdown. I'm not going to go through it, but I've got a chart that breaks down the fragments of the books they found of the Old Testament on one column. And how many times those books were quoted in the New Testament by Jesus and the apostles and other writers. And they're pretty close. In other words, the priority of the books as they're used in the New Testament, they've actually kind of fits how many fragments they found in this, these caves. It's kind of weird. But again, we're talking about preservation and we're talking about God's providence. Um, Moses is the most popular name mentioned in the sectarian manuscripts. He's mentioned 150 times. And of course, the Pentateuch is very popular, um, which we would expect in a Jewish community. Um, but here's the thing. The Pentateuch and the prophets like Isaiah and Ezekiel are all quoted by these people as authoritative. In their secular scrolls, they will quote from books of the Old Testament as authoritative. And they'll do so with Psalms and other books. So for instance, they... They refer to uh, the Old Testament as the Law, the Prophets, and David. Well, that's kind of interesting because the Hebrew Bible is generally divided into three parts, the Law, the Prophets, and the Writings. Jesus referred to the Law, the Prophets, and the Psalms in Luke chapter 24. These people referred to the Law, the Prophets, and David. And while it quotes, they quote many of these books as authoritative, Jubilees and First Enoch and all of these other apocryphal and pseudepigraphal books that we don't include in our Bibles, they don't quote as authoritative. Now this goes back 2,000 years. And I'm talking about when I say they quote them, this is in their secular scrolls, the ones where they're just, they're writing about their community, their rules, commentating on the Bible. They will quote, Old Testament books is authoritative, but pseudepigraphal and apocryphal books is not authoritative. So that's kind of interesting. So, what's the point of all this? The point is when you take what they found and you compare to what we have, then we know that our Old Testaments have been faithfully transmitted to us and that we have God's Word. 
And no, you can't look at every word because it doesn't contain every book. And Isaiah being the only complete one. But the point is that what we do have and compare is what we have. And there's very few passages that are totally different from the medieval Hebrew manuscripts and those generally align up with another translation like the Septuagint. The ones that are different from the Hebrew. So, you can know then, what I'm saying is, you can know that the Old Testament that you read, you can have confidence that the Old Testament that you read is the same Old Testament that Jesus in the other first century, the apostles, the prophets, the church. Because remember, when we read the New Testament, we read Acts, and it talks about going to the synagogues, and they talk about studying the Scriptures. What are they talking about? They're talking about the Old Testament, right? Paul told, talking to Timothy, said, you know, you, your, your mother and your grandmother taught you the, the Scriptures. Well, what Scriptures was he talking about? He's talking about the Old Testament. And that Old Testament, based on what we have found, or what archaeologists have found in this Qumran community and other Judean desert communities like Masada and others, where they have found others, what it tells us is we've got what they had. And so, that's the only reason I added this point uh, of preservation at the end is because, yeah, we can talk all day long about um, is the Bible inspired when we're talking about the original autographs. We talk about what did Moses write? What did David write? What did Isaiah write? What did Peter write? What did Paul write? We can talk all day long about, yeah, we believe that's the Word of God, but the question is, and what, the reason we've been talking about this for the last couple of weeks is, well, do we have it? And the answer is yes, we have it. So we have those things that pertain to life and godliness, and we can be confident in that. Any questions or comments about that? Pretty interesting stuff, and there's a lot more detail and things. You can read it for yourself. Um, but to me, it gives us confidence that you know God has preserved what He wants us to have. All right, that gets us down to our last section, which is probably the next slide. Um, and when you get down to it, when we're talking about Christian evidences, we talk about the existence of God, which is essential, obviously. But then we talked about all these other things along the way. Uh, you know, we talked about the flood and dinosaurs and all the things we've been through for several weeks and months. Creation versus evolution, theistic evolution, age of the earth. All that stuff's important, but it's important because it gets us basically down to these last two topics. Really. <laughs> the first being, is the Bible from God? Because if it is, if the Bible is from God and it is, then what? What's my response? What should my response be? If it's a divine book, what should my response be to it? Huh? Obey it. And if I'm going to obey it, that means I have to do what? I have to study it. Right. I should imbibe it more than any other piece of information in this world. And you can sit and watch the news all day and read newspapers. You can read novels. A lot of things you can fill your mind with that will not mean one hill of beans in eternity. and won't get you from here to there. But if this is the Word of God, and it is, we need to love it, we need to study it, we need to obey it, because it also tells us about the most important 
figure in all of human history. And that's who? Not even close. You ever uh, heard those people talk about, well, who, if it was five people you could have lunch with, or go to dinner with, who would you pick? Should that even be a close contest? Really? I mean, I could think of a few that would be interesting. But if you say, I want to have lunch or dinner with Jesus Christ, what you're saying is, I want to have dinner with God. Aren't you? Like Brother Moser always used to begin his study of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus sat down, opened his mouth, and he says, now listen, because this is God speaking. God is opening his mouth and telling you what he wants you to know. And he is the central figure in all of human history. And that's the whole reason of this study. It gets us down to this last point. Let's turn over to Matthew chapter 22. Well, you got to love the Sadducees and the Pharisees. They like, the good, they like to take a good beating. And they never seem to get tired of uh, losing. They're kind of like, what was that team that always played the Harlem Globetrotters? The Washington Generals. That's who the Sadducees and Pharisees remind me of. The Globetrotters versus the Washington Generals. They always lost. Every argument they ever had with Christ, they lost. But they just keep coming back for more. You ever known somebody like that? Just keep coming. What's that? What do they say? Keep doing the same thing over and over again with the same result? What is that? It's a sign of insanity, isn't it? Expecting a different result? Yeah. So here they are again. The Pharisees are asking him about taxes. And then the Sadducees come along in verse 23 and, and they're going to stump him on the resurrection and and that doesn't work. And you got to love verse 34. You know, they're, they're cons <laughs> they never give up. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, well, they all got together and said, let's give it another go. So one of them, a lawyer, that is an expert in the Hebrew law, asked him about the greatest commandment. Um... But here's the, the Scripture that's important to us. And this is the way we begin our study, verse 41. This is the most... I'm thinking that this has to be the most important question in the world. The most important question ever asked to a human being. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying... What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? Did you know he's asking everybody in this room, everybody listening on the internet, everybody in this world the same question? What do you think about the Christ? Because what we think about him determines how we respond to him and what happens to us after this life is over. Does it not? What do you think about him? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. He said to them, how then does David in the Spirit call him Lord? Saying, the Lord said to my Lord. God the Father said to the second member of the Godhead, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Now the Pharisees all agreed that that this was a reference to the Messiah, the Christ. That He was the Son of David. If David then calls Him Lord, how is He His Son? And no one was able to answer Him a word, nor from that day did anyone dare question Him any more. These questions that Jesus asked them, what think ye of the Christ? And how does then David in the Spirit call Him Lord? What were these questions trying to get these Pharisees to? 
to see, to admit, to understand. What was he trying to get them to understand about his nature? His deity, his deity absolutely. They're looking at a, some fellow walking around in a body like the rest of us, flesh and blood. And Jesus is trying to get them to see that he's more than that. That he's deity, that he's God in the flesh. That's what these questions were designed for. And so, when we look at Christ, there's two parts to that. Christ is a man. Christ is God. Was Christ a man? He absolutely possessed two natures. One divine, one human. 100% of both. Um, turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. You know, this verse, um, when you think about it, we've talked about this verse before. It almost blows your mind like a lot of the Bible does with its profoundness. But he says, there is one God and one mediator between God and men. The man, Christ Jesus. Was Christ a man? But it's more than that. This book was written when? Before or after His ascension? Obviously after. Does this verse say, there's one mediator between God and man who was a man? What does it say? The man, Christ Jesus. What I'm saying is, and what this verse is saying is, is that not only was He a man, not only did He come here and take on flesh, and was a man while he walked here, but in some form or fashion, ever since he ascended, he has retained that relationship with us. That whatever he gave up, his divine prerogative that he gave up when he left to come here, that was a permanent decision. I mean, we sometimes try to think about well, what all did he give up? Here he was in association with the other two members of the Godhead. He becomes a man and yet he has somehow retained that nature. He's God, but he still has this relationship with us. Isaiah said in Isaiah 53, he would be a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. As a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground, he would grow up. Genesis 3.15, he would be the what? Seed of woman. He's going to be in the flesh. And in fact, he's going to be a descendant of other men, right? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David. Galatians 4.4 4 says he was what? Born of a woman. In fact, a virgin, according to Matthew chapter 1 and Isaiah 7, 14. Matthew 1, 1 goes back and says, hey, in fact, um, Matthew gives his lineage through who? His fleshly descendants through who? Joseph. But Luke also gives his fleshly line through who? His mother. So he's flesh through and through. Not a, it's not an appearance. He's not, an, he's not a spirit looking like he's in the flesh. You know, there were angels that would make appearances in the Old Testament. And Jesus would make appearances in the Old Testament. but not, And they would look like men. But they weren't. Okay? In other words, they hadn't been born. They just appeared. Always think of that incident with Abraham when those three men showed up at his door, front door. And they looked like men to Abraham. 
But two of them, it says, did what? They went on down to Sodom to do what? Pull old Lot and anybody they could kicking and screaming out of Sodom. Those were two angels. The third guy that looked like a man was Christ. And he hung back and let Abraham barter with him over the fate of the city. And so yes, angels and even Christ would appear in the Old Testament and they would look like men, but they weren't. In fact, Jesus wrestled with Jacob. But He didn't become a man until He was born of the virgin. And I get to John chapter 1, verse 14, and it says what? He became what? Flesh. And dwelt among us. Dwelt among men. Jesus experienced the same kind of frustrations and joy that we all face. Temptation, Matthew chapter 4. He was weary, John chapter 4. Angry, Mark chapter 3. Frustrated, Mark chapter 9. Joyful, John 15. Sad, John 11. Hebrews 4.15 says what? In all points, tempted like we are, as we are yet without sin. And of course, according to Mark 15, what's the final test? What's the most important test of whether or not you're fleshly? You can die. Um, and so on several, over and over again, throughout the Gospel accounts, Jesus referred Himself to Himself many times as what? Not the Son of God, but what? Son of Man. He did that to emphasize His physical nature, the fact that He was in the flesh. But the fact that He could die cements that. Go over to 1 Timothy chapter 6. You may still be there in 1 Timothy. Look about verse 13. I urge you in the sight of God who gives life to all things and before Christ Jesus who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate that you keep this commandment without spot, blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ's appearing which He will manifest in His own time. He who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Now notice verse 16 who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has see, seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. Deity in, in pure spirit essence dwells in unapproachable light. No one can see them and live. But more importantly than that, even in the, as far as our discussion today is, is that he has immortality. That Greek word there literally means deathlessness. So the fact that Jesus could die on the cross for sure stamps the idea that, or, or the concept that he was a man in the flesh. He wasn't just an appearance. Because deity can't die in its pure in his pure spirit essence. And the Hebrews writer in chapter two says he partook of what? Flesh and blood. That through death he might bring to naught him that had the power of death, that is the devil or Satan. He partook of flesh and blood that through death. He could destroy the power of death. So Jesus was a man. But, he was also God. And I love Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. But notice what it says about our Lord and His deity. <clears throat> For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall, will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, 
Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Now, some religious groups misinterpret that English phrase, Everlasting Father. That's a Hebrew idiom. And they'll say, well, see, Christ and, uh, you know, the, the God has just one. You know, you got the oneness, is it the oneness Pentecostals and others that don't understand the three personalities of the Godhead? Think they're all one? Well, see here, Jesus is called Everlasting Father. Now, that's not what that phrase means in the Hebrew. What does it mean? What's another translation of this phrase? Literally, it could be translated, Father of Eternity. And every member of the Godhead is eternal. And I'm talking about eternal in the complete sense. Not like, I mean, we've been created, but now we have spirits that will not, they'll spend eternity somewhere. But God as an eternal being has no beginning and no end. So, He is the Father of eternity. But He's not the Father as far as His person is concerned. And of course, the name Jehovah that we read in the New Old Testament is many times referred to Christ, is it not? Uh, Isaiah 40 verse 3 in the American Standard says, The voice of one that crieth, prepare ye in the wilderness the way of who? Jehovah. Make level in the desert a highway for our God. That is a reference to Christ, of course, referred to as Jehovah. And of course, we're all familiar with John chapter 1. And we don't need to skip over that before I get to Hebrews. Let's go to John chapter 1. And as long as you don't have a watchtower translation, you're okay by going to John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Now notice, all things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and the light was the, life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. The agent through whom the physical universe was made was who? Christ. So well, how do you know that's Him? Well, because in that same context, you go down to verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. and We beheld His glory, the glories of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. In the beginning was the Word. He was with God. He was God. Everything was created through and by Him. Go over to Hebrews chapter 1. And I've said this many times, but I don't, you know, you can't really say, you can't pick. All I can tell you is Hebrews chapter 1 to me is one of the most, I can't say it's the most, but it's one of the most sublime chapters in the New Testament as it speaks to the nature of Christ. Because God at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets as in these last days spoken to us by His Son, whom He has appointed heir of all things. Now notice, similar to John chapter 1, through whom, also, through whom also He made the worlds, and who being the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person, upholding all things by the word of His power, when He had by Himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as He has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. He created the worlds. They exist because of Him. It, it keeps going because of Him. But then he starts quoting all these Old Testament passages regarding Christ. And specifically, I want to look at Psalm 1, where he quotes Psalm 102, 25 through 27. Look at verse 10. You, Lord, talking about Christ, Jehovah, in the beginning laid the foundations of the earth. And the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will grow old like a garment, like a cloak. You will fold them up and they will be changed. But you are the same and your years will not fail. Let's talk about Christ. 
He laid the foundation of the earth. The heavens are the work of His hands. And by the way, He'll be the one that folds them up like a garment when He comes back. We'll pick up there next week. Choices regarding Christ's deity. I think Josh McDowell mentioned this in his work, but C.S. Lewis might have been one of the first ones to mention this. You've got three options regarding Christ. And the reason that's important is because what do many people say, and we'll leave you with this, what do, what's many people's attitude in the world toward Christ? Oh, he was a good guy. Good moral teacher. Like to help people. Right? That's not a choice. Not from the way he's portrayed in the New Testament. You, those are your three choices. We'll talk about those next week. And then um, by next week, that's going to look a little different because I've expanded that outline a little bit. We'll pick up there.